Hey church family, just thank you so much for tuning in online. Uh, we know this season has been crazy with coronavirus and we know um, that even though we are offering an in-person service now, um, that some of you still feel more comfortable staying at home. And so we wanted to be able to offer this to you. Um, so thanks for joining in. If you are um, somebody watching this and you've never gone to our church, um, we encourage you to visit our website, og.church, to get to know a little bit more about our, our, our staff, um, what we're about. Um, we also encourage you that as things begin to open up, to come visit our church. Um, come check us out, give us a call, um, leave a comment. We'd love to get to know you more, to pray for you. If you, if you need anything, we, we'd love to help you in any way that we can. Um, also, uh, you can still give your tithes, offerings, any gifts to og.church forward slash donate. Um, and you can make a donation there. You can also uh, send your checks to the church office, drop them off at any time, um, and we can do that as well. Um, but we are praying for you this season and, and know that we're here for anything. So, so let us know if you need help, um, assistance with anything. Don't, don't feel bad about asking. We'd love to help you. Um, but we hope that you find this uh, message challenging, um, a blessing to whatever it is you're at in life. And we just pray that the Spirit would move in your heart and mind. And we look forward to seeing you in person um, soon. Um, but again, enjoy the message and we'll see you later. Hey church, again, thanks for joining us here online. It's great to see you. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and share this so that your friends, family, other church members can see it, join in with us. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, welcome. Leave us a comment. Let us know who's watching there with you. Um, but if you have your Bibles, open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we continue our series in the book of 2 Timothy called Upside Down Impact. And we've looked at a lot in this series. We've looked at loyalty, what it means to remain faithful to the Lord no matter what. We've also looked at uh, strength and the fact that our strength comes from the Lord and we need to be strong in him. And also we saw that we need to choose courage over fear, no matter what the obstacle is before us. Um, be courageous in Christ and know that the Holy Spirit of God in you is not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. Um, and then also last week we saw that we need to be truthful. We need to maintain the truth, live the truth uh, of God's word, and uphold the truth of God's word and who God is and who Jesus is and what God has accomplished in and through Christ. And so today we're going to look at purity. Now next week we end this series, we'll look at endurance, but today we are going to look at purity. And to start off, before we actually look at the text, I want to share the story of David and Goliath. And I've got a painting here of that that a guy did. But this is a very famous story, we, we know how it goes, right? David defeats Goliath with the stone and everything. But we often read through that story or hear that story, we, we skip over the minor details, and, and one of those details comes when David is actually picking out the stones in the stream. And of course, the author tells us that he has a staff and he goes to the stream and he picks up five smooth stones. And I have a smooth stone here. And he picks up five of these. And he says they were smooth stones. Now, what I picture there is kind of knowing Caroline, because they love to pick up cool rocks and, and find smooth ones like this, is I picture, you know, kind of a child just going through the stream and picking up a rock. No, that's too hard. That's too jagged. No, picking up this. No, that's not right. It's too big. And then finally picking up one that looks like this and say, man, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for, right? Well, this, in essence, is what David does, is he goes and he's, 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 he's being very methodical and uh, intentional on the type of rock that he is looking for, and he's looking for this smooth stone that will fit his pouch, um, his slingshot, and that will be good with the velocity and everything like that um, so that he could defeat Goliath. Now, what's interesting about that is a smooth stone, how it becomes smooth is something called abrasion. Now, in scientific terms and according to any dictionary, abrasion is the process of wearing away a surface by friction. So a rock, those five stones that David would have picked out, a rock undergoes abrasion when particles of sand or small pieces of rock are carried across its surface by a glacier, a stream, or the wind. So here's David, the shepherd boy, before he goes into battle, he's there choosing those five stones, picking up some, putting some back, methodically choosing or looking for the one that he needs for his purpose. And then he chooses those stones out of the stream, kept them safe in his bag, and then he sent one out to defeat Goliath. But the stones were not ready overnight, and this is where abrasion comes in. 
Those stones took years of mixing with and being shaped by other rocks. Years of abrasion would be needed for those rocks, those pebbles, to be well-equipped and ready for the calling or their purpose, namely for David to use one of them to defeat the enemy, Goliath. And the reason I bring up the story of David and Goliath is because this is the kind of imagery Paul is getting at with 2 Timothy. Timothy must be ready. He must be prepared. He must be set apart, right? And he must be pure. And that's why we're going to talk about purity. And we're going to see how that is accomplished. So look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. You'll see the words on the screen there if you don't have a Bible. And this is what Paul writes. He says, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but there's also vessels or utensils of wood and clay. Some are for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So he says, verse 22, So flee, Timothy, youthful passions or desires, and instead pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, and pursue peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. So picture yourself in the kitchen. I got a picture here of a chef here, right? So picture yourself, you're in the kitchen, you're the chef, um, you're the master of the kitchen, and you're preparing a masterful meal. And you've reached the step in the process where you need a spatula. You don't need a whisk. You don't need a knife. And you sure don't need a ladle. You need a spatula. It has to be a spatula. And so you proceed to rummage through the jar on the counter that has all of those kitchen utensils, right? And it always has way too many utensils. They're all jammed in there. At least that's how it is at our house, right? So you go, you're going through that jar, kind of like David going to the stream, and you're trying to find the right utensil. You're trying to find that spatula. And then at last, you find it. And you pick up the utensil, only then to discover that there's old food and mold covering the spatula. Faced with such an icky situation, you as the master of the kitchen, the chef, would you then use that spatula to prepare the meal or to accomplish that step in the meal? The answer is of course not because the utensil would be unusable. It's dirty, it's nasty, it's not ready for use. Paul uses the same analogy with Timothy. Basically saying, Timothy, we are like utensils in the master's house, in the master's kitchen. And he needs us at certain times and in certain ways to accomplish his good work. Just like David needed those particular stones on that day. And so, because of that, we must always be prepared and ready for such times. So how do we remain prepared? How do we become these useful utensils that are useful for the Lord? Well, for Paul, it starts with purity. It starts with purity. You must be pure. You must be pure in your thoughts, in your words, and in your actions. You must be a man or woman of faith, of love, of peace, of integrity. And if you do that, if you remain pure, then three things, Paul tells us, three things right here. If you remain pure, then number one, you will be set apart for the Lord. You will be holy. That word that Paul uses there literally means to be set apart or consecrated to the Lord. You will be set apart for him. Right? It's just like David picking up those stones. They were set apart for David. You will be set apart for the Lord. The second thing is you will be useful for the Lord. You'll be like that spatula that he can actually use because it's clean. It's ready for use. And number three, you will be prepared for the Lord. Like a servant of the Lord, you'll be prepared in season and out of season if you remain pure. And this is what Paul is getting at. He says, listen, if you want to be um, one of those utensils that the Lord can use, if we want to be like those stones that David used, then we must remain pure, pure in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Whether we are by ourselves 
whether we're with coworkers or close friends, whether we are gathering with a body of believers, whether we're at home or at work or in the community, we must remain pure. So I want to take you back to the middle of the 1300s. 700 years I want to take you back, and I want you to picture these 12 trading ships, right? These are not the exact ships. This is just a painting. But I want you to go back to the, mid, uh, the middle of the 1300s and just picture these 12 trading ships. Well, these 12 ships had been out on a long journey through the Black Sea. And after this long journey, they then come to Europe, And they dock at a Sicilian port. And as they're approaching the dock, many people had gathered there on the docks to welcome them back. Friends, family members, those who hadn't seen them in weeks and months, um, city uh, residents and officials. And it was kind of a, a, a scene of excitement of, man, welcome them back. Kind of like a welcome party. And so there are the people there gathered on the docks with this excitement, but it quickly As the ships began to dock, the mood changed drastically, like a flash of light. They went from being excited to being horrified. Because most of the sailors aboard the ships were dead. And those who were still alive were seriously ill, gravely sick. They were overcome with fever unable to keep food down, and they were delirious from pain. And the strangest thing of all, to all those who had gathered on the docks, the ones remaining alive were covered in mysterious black boils, which gave their illness its name, the Black Death. And over the next five years, after the boarding of these 12 ships at the dock, this mysterious Black Death would kill more than 20 million people in Europe alone. At that time, that was almost one-third of the continent's population. Now, this hits home right now with coronavirus and people looking at numbers and how many people have died and who are sick and everything. Coronavirus, at least thus far, doesn't even compare to the Black Death. That was a third of the continent's population in that day. To put that in today's perspective, there's around 740 million people who live on the continent of Europe. That would be like more than... 200 million of them dying over the next five years. And in the U.S. numbers, we have over 300 million. That'd be like over 100 million people dying here in the U.S. over the next five years. That was how severe the Black Death was. And so today, scientists understand that the Black Death, it's spread by a germ that wouldn't be discovered until the late 1800s by a French biologist. And that germ they found out, it came from infected fleas that were feasting on rats. It's very gross to even imagine. But think about the fleas were infected with this germ. And there they were feasting on these rats. And then the rats eventually just spread the disease to human beings. And once it hit the humans, it was over. So there you had this seemingly insignificant germ riding on these ships from these little small fleas. But this germ that was unseen, it was small, it was invisible to the naked eye, yet it was very, very powerful in how it corrupted and infected and destroyed. The same is true of impurity. Impurity of any kind, whether we're talking sexual impurity, greed, envy, jealousy, pride, arrogance, gossip, slander, etc., Impurity of all kinds or of any kind in our lives is like a nasty infection. Starts off as a very, very small, seemingly insignificant germ. Yet it grows and spreads like a wicked cancer, just like the Black Death. And it's very, very powerful in how it corrupts and how it infects and how it destroys This is why Paul is telling Timothy, you must remain pure. If you're to be set apart for the Lord, if you're to be useful for the Lord, if you're to be prepared and ready for the Lord when he comes calling, when he comes and picks you up out of that utensil jar, then your thoughts, Timothy, your words and your actions had better be full of love, humility, and integrity. This is how you stay ready for use in the master's kitchen. You remain pure. 
And in order to remain pure, in order to achieve this, Paul says to run from anything or flee from them, anything that stimulates youthful lusts. He says, instead, pursue righteous living or righteousness and faith and love and peace. In other words, we must be intentional and diligent about what we run from and what we run to. There's a story of a 17-year-old girl named Barbara McVeigh. She was 17 in the year 1966. And her dad was stationed with the Air Force in the UK. And, as she would later say, she also liked English boys. So here her dad was stationed in the UK, she liked English boys, and she was a 17-year-old girl. So because of these two reasons, Barbara wanted to go to the UK, and this was her problem. She lived in Baltimore. So her dad's in the UK, she wants to go travel to the UK, but she lives in Baltimore. So what she did, according to Time Magazine, is what any teen in 1966 would do, or today, she stowed away on something like this, a submarine. She literally climbed aboard a submarine, hid herself on the submarine after finding out that this submarine was bound for Britain. She knew, or the reason she did this is because she was running away from where she didn't want to be, which was Baltimore, and she was running to where she wanted to be, the UK where her dad was. Of course, she was found out and returned after like four hours. But still, she knew where she needed to go. And she knew what she needed to do to get there. And she did whatever it took. Even including climbing aboard a vessel like this. This is what we're to do when it comes to purity. This is what Paul is getting at. We're to run away from youthful lusts. Which, by the way, this means that those lusts, those desires you had when you were a youth still rear their ugly heads when, you're inter, when you enter adulthood. They don't leave you. But you must run from them. You must flee them. You must get rid of them at all cost. As Jesus would say, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, get rid of it. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, get rid of it. In other words, get serious. Get radical. Get real about running away from those lustful desires. That's not where you want to be. Because they are like a nasty infection that will corrupt you and infect you and destroy you. And they will prevent you from being ready for use in the master's kitchen. And instead, we're to run, so we're to run away from those things. And instead, we're to pursue or run after or run to righteousness, pure living. Pure thoughts, pure words, pure actions. We're to run to faith. We're to trust the Lord no matter what. We're not not to be full of doubt and skepticism and distrust. We're to run to faith. We're to run to love. We're to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we're to love others just as Jesus loved us. So we run to righteousness, we run to faith, we run to love, and we run to peace. We seek to maintain unity and peace among everyone. Those in the church and those outside the church. So, running to these things, running from youthful lust and running to these things, produces some questions to think about, and I've got them here on the screen. How are you spending your time? In your free time, what are you running to? What gets your attention? What captures your heart, your mind, your thoughts? Where are you directing your heart? What's the topic of your conversations? And how are you living when you're by yourself? or with your close buddies or friends? These are questions to think about when we're trying to think about, am I running from impurity, youthful lust, and am I running to righteousness and faith and love and peace? These are questions to think about. What are you running from 
and what are you running to? Are you running from God and instead running to your youthful lust? Or are you running from your youthful lust and instead running to God's? And so as we seek to remain prepared by maintaining pure lives, we must recognize also that we can't do this alone. You cannot maintain purity alone. You cannot direct your hearts and your minds and your thoughts to the Lord um, without any hiccups, without any troubles by yourself. You can't do it alone. This is why Paul says, basically, if you want to maintain purity, then you must maintain fellowship with the church. You must, as one translation says, enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Or as the translation I just read, the ESV, running to the church, pursuing also the church, those who call on the name of the Lord with pure hearts. So you must be loyal to the church. You must not make it a habit of not gathering with other believers. Whether we're talking online in this season or in person when the opportunities arise. You must maintain companionship, fellowship with the church because you can't do it by yourself. And if you think you can, what's going to happen is is you're going to get picked off. And you will eventually and inevitably wander off the path of truth and begin indulging with impurity of all kinds, which will eventually and inevitably corrupt and infect and destroy your life, your relationships, your family. So to recap, we must be ready for the Lord to use us in big ways, in season and out of season, always be ready. We must remember that we are like utensils in the master's kitchen and that he needs us at certain times and certain ways to accomplish his good work, just like David needed those stones at that specific time to be ready for him. So we must always be prepared and ready for such times when the Lord needs us. And we maintain our readiness by maintaining purity, being pure. And we maintain purity by watching, being on guard of how we think, how we speak, how we act, and by being on guard of what we're running from and what we're running to. We should always be pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace, and pursuing fellowship with other believers especially in this COVID-19 world, more so than ever, we must be utensils always fit and ready for the master's work. So I want to leave you with one last illustration, and it comes from the Navy SEALs. i got a picture of some SEALs here. These guys are awesome. They're incredible. They are the best of the best, top notch. And because of that, the SEALs here are called out on specific, very unique and special operations, special missions. And when not chosen to go out on a mission, like when they're not out there serving on mission, they are constantly training, constantly. Readying themselves, being prepared and set apart for when the time comes. That they, like stones, can be picked from the stream and then used to do big things, to satisfy the the demands of the mission, to be successful. As a servant of the Lord, belonging to him, he is our master. As a servant of the Lord, we must be like Navy SEALs. Always readying ourselves. Always maintaining purity. Always prepared and set apart for when the time comes. That, like stones in David's situation, the master can come, pick us up out of the stream or out of that utensil jar and use us for big things to use us for his good work so that we can be clean, useful spatulas, so to speak, ready for the master of the kitchen. Listen, if we want to have an upside-down impact on the world, if, if we want God to use us to do big things, to change the world, then we must remain loyal, faithful to the Lord, putting him first in our lives, We must be strong in the Lord. We must be courageous, choosing courage over fear. We must uphold and maintain and live and proclaim the truth. And we must be pure. 
by running away from youthful lust and running to the Lord, running to righteousness, faith, love, and peace. This is how we can have an upside down impact because we will be ready for God to come and use us at certain times and in certain ways to satisfy and accomplish his good work. So be pure, maintain purity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you right now. God, we thank you for this time that we could gather. God, I know it's online, it's not ideal, but God, I thank you that we could still gather. And I thank you for your word that, it, that is timeless, that it's living and active, that it pierces us. And God, I think if we're all honest, God, all of us, we, we're, the way we spend our time, our thoughts, our, our actions, our words, God, many of them are not steered in the right direction. God, if we were being honest, we, we need to admit, we need to run from those things, those youthful lusts, those things that stimulate youthful lusts. And we need to pursue and run after righteousness and faith and love and peace. That we need to run to you doing whatever it takes. So God, I pray that you would help us to maintain purity, fill us with your spirit, purify our thoughts and our actions and our words and our conversations. God, I pray that the fellowship of the church would just grow stronger, cast out anybody that's not of genuine faith, expose their counterfeit faith. And God, I pray that we'd make it a habit of pursuing each other, those relationships, because we can't do it by ourselves. We need each other to pray for each other, to, to encourage, to lift each other up. So God, I pray that, that we could be utensils in your kitchen, ready, pure, set apart, useful, prepared for you. Whenever you need us, whenever you come to the stream and pull us out, that we'd be ready for your good work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.